like Mark Farber, um, and I was watching, uh, I've, in the last two years, I've been watching a lot of their talks. And, I, and I've seen talks where there's very wealthy people talking to other very wealthy people, and only intending information for wealthy person to wealthy person talks. And in a lot of these talks, they talk about how right now is the time for wealthy people to build bunkers. They talk about this. They talk about mm. buy land, get guns, get resources, get renewable energy systems for your own kind of estate. Because when times get tough and the rabble, like the rest of us, the 99, you know, when times get tough, some of them are going to be dying and starving. But you're going to be okay as long as you set up your little kind of kingdom. So we're, we're talking about fiefdoms and fiefdoms right now. And um, this is where this kind of logical conclusion to this society reaches. If you, if you follow capitalism all the way through, that's where it, it eventually goes, to a very, very powerful few select, and the rest of us either on the brink of desperation or somewhere in between that pyramid. I think part of that is because of people's lack of ability to think outside the box. So a lot of those people, it's because they don't see any other alternatives. They're not reading this stuff. They're not thinking about this stuff. Because, of course, living in a bunker in a, in a world that is so thoroughly polluted with climate catastrophe and everything else is not going to be very much fun or very healthy or helpful for their children or their children's children. I saw, I saw a special, I'll get to you right after, I saw a special um, a month ago about um, this, this, this guy, he has a corporation in the United States and his corporation is building bunkers for the elite and they start at around five million, they go up to hundreds of millions of dollars. So we're not talking about little bunk, we're not talking about like survivalists storing some food or something, we're talking about multi-level underground buildings that are hardened by wow. concrete that have all the amenities, swimming pools, a multi-level, multi-level. And in the last two years, his business has gone up 500%. 500%. So this is how the elite are thinking. If you think they're not thinking like this, they are. They're so, looking for Armageddon. They know that the poor and the working class are going to get to Yes. Real quick, there's a study about uh, intelligence and how, and this may seem obvious, but like conservative or people who are defending the system, they're not, they're not intelligent. They're lacking this physiological thing in the brain. No. And they're, they have less, and, and more fear. A lot more fear, so they have to. So they would fear yes. sharing, sharing, yes. you call it, you know. Well, actually, fear does something. You know. it, it, so when you us are, people are more right. intelligent. When you are caught up in the fear response, it is hard. I, I agree with you. Uh, upper brain shuts down. Uh, uh, a lot of people so instead of cross talk, hold on. Raise your hand. I, I can see like I'm not gonna. Get, I think it's time for discussing because I can see a lot of people want to. So raise your hand. We'll talk. We'll take a stack. I'm not done. I'm not even near done. Need to finish. Okay. So can you hold? If you can hold your comments a little bit, I'm gonna go through. I'll take. I'll take another example. Um, and I didn't really even go into detail on either the f first two examples, which I could go in deeper. Right. I'm going to take food, water, and agriculture as another example. Which Something we all need, right? Everyone Good, needs. clean water and food, right? So in the, in the current system of food production, it's mass produced by, again, very large corporations. Archer Daniel Midlands, we could go into Monsanto. Um, uh, very, very large corporations control agriculture in the West and pretty much all over the world. Um, and then you look at large producers of, of industrial, industrialized foods, Tyson Chicken, McDonald's, uh, where they literally have factories that produce industrialized food products. Now, never in this system is it ever asked, what are the basic human needs for nutrition? How do we meet those in the most healthy way to produce the healthiest human being? That's not even in the equation. What's in the equation is, how do you mass produce food on a scale that makes the most profit for the least input? So that's the equation that's being worked with that is going into your body and your consciousness every day on a mass scale on this planet. Not what makes the healthiest food to make the healthiest human beings, which I know I'm not the smartest person in the world, but if I were approaching a problem of food and agriculture and water, I, even though I'm stupid, the first question I would ask is, how do we make people healthy with 
the food and water that we're going to produce. Somehow that has been put aside <laughs> and we're asking other questions. So that's the first problem with how food and agriculture is done in this in industrial society. It's mass produced, it's low quality, and it's based upon profit again. And if you look at the systems of growth, one of the things we found in the last hundred years we've lost in the United States alone 12 inches of topsoil. We don't have another 12 inches to lose. When, when the when the, uh, white settlers first came on, on, the, on the shores of the United States, the average topsoil depth in the United States was nine feet. The average topsoil depth today is 12 inches. Wow. And, that, and most of that was lost in the last 150 years since modern agricultural production has started. That means we are at a crisis point with the soil. Crisis. We are in red territory. We don't have an inch to lose, much less another foot. So, and it's because of the way we produce food. It's with a lot of oil. Oil is the number one product used in modern agriculture, from the pesticides and fungicides that we use to the way we fuel tractors for large-scale food production. It is highly inefficient. Fertilizer as well. Highly inefficient. We are not using the latest technology for producing food. Uh, we could be... And not renewable. Right, exactly, not renewable. We could be using, um, we could, we could, if we we're going to use tractors, we could use tractors that ran on renewable energy sources. We could have electric tractors. We could have um, uh, uh, biofuel tractors. We could be using tractors that at least don't destroy the environment. Right? How come they don't do that? <laughs> uh, can anybody do this? Let's all do this together. It's not profitable. Every, every time you have a question, just everyone just raise your hands and do this with me, okay? Then we'll it's not just profitable. move along. It's common. I'm one-handed at this point, so I get, okay. I get it. I get let me get let me get through this. Hold, hold your questions, and then we'll have a whole discussion about all this. It. It's not profitable. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. Everything's about so. Oh, oh. So uh, one of the things we could be using is vertical growing systems or growing towers, which are completely controlled controlled environment where you know the, uh, using hydroponics how much food you can produce. You can produce them right in communities. We don't have to ship them. You know, we don't need to eat oranges from Venezuela. We could actually produce yeah. them right here in Buffalo. We could produce our own food here. But of course, that would take us asking these questions, which we're not asking. I just realized, I just got a time check. I realized I'm over. I realized we have another talk. And I realized you have things to say. So I'm going to stop here, even though I have like nine more pages to go. <laughs> I guess I'll have to do resource-based economy too. <laughs> yes. So let's let's take a stack. Let's keep the keep this to maybe five ten minutes max before we move into the next. I have to have to get out this thing. Uh, this is the beginning of Occupy Economics, and we need everybody in the movement to get educated on these economic issues. So I, I want us to have it clear in our minds that this is school now, because you have to get empowered so the movement stronger. All right. So you really need to finish the talk. Maybe not today, we'll have another one. Yep. Um, so we'll have to schedule a teaching or whatever, but we need to be ratcheted up. Yep. So let's take a stack again, try to keep your questions short, your comments short, so we can move into the next talk. So my, my question is about, is it about sunk costs? Because they're sort of like, for the people who are profiting from the way things are, if things change, then they wouldn't be profiting. They would have to, go through all that transitional phase. Oh, that's and right. So they don't, they'd rather just keep making yeah. money. That's correct. We've got to get them off their addiction because they're going to have a withdrawal in Jones. <laughs> My point to make is, I think the most important question after the, all this education of ourselves is what are we going to do about it? Like, what are the steps? I need a path forward. I know, to, know enough, and I, it's just really frustrating not being on the path. So I think I think the, I think I think Heron probably raised the raised the most important point. The first point, especially as an Occupy Buffalo movement, is for us to be informed. Right, our own moniker, Inform, Reform, Transform. Before we can move towards Transform, I mean uh, Reform, right, which would be the transition phase to move to Transform, which would be kind of implementing this, right. Before we could do that, we first have to be really well informed. And though many of us think we already are, I think there's already there's plenty of room for. Absolutely being better informed. Is the reason we import so many uh, fruits and vegetables because they're more cheaper and it's more expensive 
to you know just get it right here in, in the United States? Yeah, I'll, I'll give it to you this way. If I can make 10 cents on an orange in profit, I don't care if it comes from California, Venezuela, Israel, I don't care where it comes from, that's where it's gonna come from if I can make 10 cents on an orange. Yeah. Oh, okay. Simple. That makes sense. Well, that's the one thing that I really think about is uh, the Schopenhauer quote. Uh, I would say we're the first part of it, right? Uh, about the fact that a lot, we're being ridiculed a lot of this in the media. Right. But um, for the, you said that you're on the edge of the democracy about being a computing system eventually. Uh, how would you get rid of the bad eggs then? I mean, people who are still stuck in that second, that the whole violent kind of uh, the Schopenhauer quote. How, I mean, what would be the, reg like, the regulating force? Would it just be the fact that more. The power of love beats the love of the, the, the old Jimmy Hendrix quote. Sure, and it's a great, it's a great question. Yeah, it's a great question. And the, and the reality is that once we actually had this system established, you would have such a small minority of people who would ever want to go back to a slave system. You would never want to go back. You may still have a few, but the overwhelming power of the majority of the people would want to enjoy the system. But you, I just think once it was established, it's getting established is the hard part. Once it's established, I doubt that it would ever go backwards just because the education would be so much higher. People would be learning about this. You'd be learning your whole life. So, and you, and you would be able to spend your time really the way you choose to spend it. And it would probably be towards the benefit of others because you would want to contribute. The second thing I just want to mention was key coil is not yeah, well, I mean, it, I'm sure you've seen the movie Collapse. I mean, you mentioned it. Yeah. Uh, it's the misconception a lot of people I know have is that they think peak oil is us not having enough, like us not having oil anymore. It's not getting enough oil out in the first place. That's right. And the, people are confronting the symptoms of the problem. They should be confronting the cause, which is the, the whole idea that we don't have a resource case account. Yeah. <laughs> Valerie. No, no, no. Hold on. I'll put you on the list, Valerie. John's next. Okay. Thank you. He's got to start. A couple points. I just wanted to suggest maybe. A reading list and at least some articles and maybe an online dialogue so you can hash out some of these things maybe on a Facebook page. I will do that. Um, and that kind of may get rid of some of the time here. But also that uh, I think that we really need to focus on being an example of resource-based economies in every way possible and really exemplifying and showing people because to truly inform people conceptually you can, but visually and actually seeing the functionality of it because we're all, you know, we're instilled with this institutional fear of any other kind of system, whether it's, you know, communism, socialism, any word other than capitalism is automatically inherently evil and it's just not going to work and that's an accepted premise through all out your entire education until you get to college, but that's still in the back of your mind. So I think that showing people how resource-based economies work and encouraging people who have resources but may not have money to exchange those resources and not use money is the real way to really educate people. That's a great, great. I'm gonna stop here. I know there's people on stack. We only have 40 minutes left and we do have Joseph Tadar who's here to do his talk. And I think it would be unfair to continue um, with my talk without giving him a chance to present. So, and believe me, we will we will cover this again. You're gonna hear more about this, obviously. Come to the Occupy Economics conferences. There's gonna be several of them. They're all gonna be advertised. Get involved. I will put these resources online. You can start to read. There's a lot to read, a lot to, to grab. And I'm gonna make a quick plug. If you haven't read this book, please read it. Sacred Which Economics it? by um, uh, Charles Eisenstein. Excellent book about moving forward, about transition. Thank you. Well, thank you. Yeah. And Joe's talk today, we'll just go right into it, is on community-based currency, grassroots self-empowerment through using local money, a discussion of a more democratic system, economic system, so yes.